Continuing Education knows that at the end, students want to graduate. We believe that there's an option for every student. We are there to help students and serve them. It's, it's our mission. And education is transformational. It changes lives. My name is William Mano. I am political science national affairs major, University of Colorado Boulder, and today I'll be presenting you the panel, Can We Make Healthcare Cheaper and Better? Obviously, healthcare is a main topic and area of concern moving forward for the U.S. as seen in the last presidential debate and election. I hope this panel illuminates some potential solutions and alternatives to a better healthcare system so that people don't get bankrupt. This panel is going to be help illuminating and solving and looking at problems and solutions of our healthcare system currently. I really hope you enjoy this panel as it will be informative and interesting as a, prevalent, as a prevalent topic that will not be away anytime soon. Our esteemed panelists are, one of the, are some of the best in the world and they'll be looking forward to answering your questions and talking about problems that really matter. I hope you enjoy. My name is David Backrack and I'm coming to you from this 1965 TV set. Why? I'll explain in just a moment, but first, Welcome and thank you for joining the CU Conference on World Affairs panel, Can We Make Healthcare Better and Cheaper? We have the costliest healthcare system in the world, but with only average outcomes. Our panelists will pre present some solutions. All of the CWA panels are being recorded on YouTube and will be available to watch immediately after each event on the CWA YouTube channel. You may submit questions at any time during the session through the YouTube chat function. We invite you to indicate if you are a CU student and to share the location you are joining us from. And those of us in Boulder, especially those of us in South Boulder, grieve for our 10 community members murdered in the horrific event that took place less than three weeks ago. Before I introduce my speaker, let me explain the mid-60s TV background. England's Prime Minister Winston Churchill is alleged to have said, Americans will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. It was 1965 when Congress passed into law the Medicare and Medicaid Act that provided health insurance to the elderly, those over 65, and to the poor. This was over considerable objections voiced by the American Medical Association and organized medicine. The origin of this legislation dates to 1932. 1932, 33 years earlier when one of two five-year studies was published as the report of the Committee on the Cost of Medical Care. The other report was a recommendation to Congress on the establishment of a program to provide old age benefits, which came to be known as Social Security. 1932, the depths of the Great Depression. In 1930, Americans were spending 4% of the gross domestic, domestic product on health care, 4%. In 1930, the average life expectancy for men born in 1930 was 58 and 62 years uh, for women. Since this legislation was written by men in their 40s, Born in 1890, their life expectancy at their birth averaged 48 years. A child born in the U.S. today, 79 years. So the idea that having employed workers, then almost all men, contribute to a government-run trust fund that would pay them after age 65, if they live that long, seemed like a pretty good actuarial bet. FDR had these two proposals before him. The country was just coming out of the Great Depression, but, but it was before World War II. He did not believe that he could take both proposals forward, so he shelved the Committee on the Cost of Medical Care idea and advanced Social Security, which was signed into law in August 1935. But it took until 1942 
for the first benefits to be awarded. In 1942, we were in the middle of World War II, and FDR issued an executive order freezing wages, but legislation supporting the wage freeze had a loophole that permitted employers to offer health benefits to workers in lieu of wage increases. It was during this period that employer-funded health insurance became widespread. And it was, and it remains, income tax-free to both the employer and the employee. When the war ended, ended and soldiers re-entered the workforce, the prevalence of health insurance for Americans who worked for larger companies became commonplace, but not so for the self-employed and the millions who worked for small companies. But the elderly and the poor remained uncovered. 1965, over the continuing protestations of the AMA and healthcare providers in general, Medicare and Medicaid was implemented. Fast forward to 2010. After years of debate, remember the Hillary Clinton-led effort to implement health care financing reform in 1993, 61 years after the recommendations of the Committee on the Cost of Medical Care? But those efforts died in the 1990s, and in, 19, and in 2010, by the narrowest of margins, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, was passed into law. It was and is imperfect, but it expanded access and affordability through insurance, insurance, the spreading of risk and the leveling of premium costs across large populations, um, affordability to millions more Americans. Our former president and many in his party promised to take down Medicare uh, and Obamacare, I'm sorry, to take down Obamacare and replace it with Actually, we never heard what they were going to replace it with, so fortunately, much of it remains. Here we are, 2021, dealing with a pandemic, a need to return to school, to jobs, to the American lifestyle we so value, and health care financing reform will be back on the table within two years, 90 years after the report of the Committee on the Cost of Medical Care, 56 years after Medicare and Medicaid were implemented. Will we get it right? In 1965, this 19-inch black and white TV cost about $300. That's $2,500 in 2021 dollars. Today, you can buy a 19-inch high-def flat-screen TV at Best Buy for $70. That's $8.50 in 1965 dollars. TVs are one of the few things uh, whose cost has, is markedly less today than it was 60 years ago. Healthcare, not so. 4% of the GDP in 1932, 20% of the GDP in 2020. Americans will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Our panelists today, Allison Hoffman, professor, the University of Pennsylvania, Carey Law School and Senior Fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics, a graduate of Dartmouth College and the Yale Law School. Allison publishes on politics and health law. Daryl Kirch is President Emeritus of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Daryl is a graduate of the University of, Col of Colorado and CU School of Medicine. He trained as a psychiatrist and served at the National Institute of Mental Health before becoming Dean and Senior Vice President at the Medical College of Georgia, then moving to Penn State's Medical Center in Hershey in a similar position before becoming President of the AAMC in 2006. Darrell is a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Trina Sudaros. Trina is Managing Editor and Regulatory center leader, excuse me, of um, PricewaterhouseCoopers Health Research Institute, a think tank inside the firm that focuses on trends shaping the U.S. health industry. Trina is also co-host of the podcast Next in Health. Before coming to PwC, Trina was a journalist for 17 years, including covering science and medicine on the investigative team at the Chicago Tribune. She returns as a panelist to the C uh, Conference on World Affairs. 
Trina is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Allison? Hi, everyone. It's very nice to be here today and to be on a panel with an amazing group of thinkers on this topic. I want to start off our, our conversation today with a high level overview of the healthcare system. For those of you who think about this on a daily basis, much of this will uh, not be news to you. But for those of you who don't, I think this will help to frame the conversation that will follow. So let me share some slides. Okay, can you all see my slides? Good, great. So let me just start with the kind of the highest level reflection on our healthcare system, which builds a little bit on what David was saying in his introduction, which is that we we spend a lot on healthcare. So this is this is looking at the fact that we spend way more than our peer countries. The US is that big red bar uh, as a percentage of GDP. We spend even more of that a little bit now. This is uh, this is slightly older data. And you can see as compared to the OECD average, we spend twice as much. And even as compared to the next most expensive country, Switzerland, we spend quite a bit more of our GDP on healthcare. Now we're a wealthy country and that might be okay to spend a lot on healthcare if we got really tremendous outcomes. If we were the healthiest people in the world, uh, you probably know that we're not having watched the health of this country through a pandemic over the last year. So this is just a snapshot of the fact that in many of the kinds of care uh, categories that we would care a lot about if we if we were measuring the system based on outcomes, we don't score all that well. So if you look at this, the little red dots are the US, the other dots are other countries, and it gives you a range. So for example, life expectancy at birth from the worst to the best from Latvia to uh, to Japan, and we're towards the lower end of that. Um, you know, quality of acute care at the bottom, safety during childbirth from Canada to Poland, again, we're towards the bottom of that. So if we put all this together in one picture, this is what it looks like. This is one of my favorite images when, it, uh, when we think about the healthcare system, which is that we spend more and we get less. So as you look at this, at this slide, if you go across the bottom of the slide from the left to the right, you see spending on healthcare increasing uh, per capita. And, and this is in adjusted US dollars. As you move up the slide, you, this is a measure of life expectancy. So where you want to be is on or above that arcing line that goes across the slide. And you can see that we're an outlier. We spend way more than other countries and we're way below that line. So for um, in terms of life expectancy, we look similar to countries that spend a quarter or less than what we do on healthcare. Why are so why are we so expensive? That's the easier part of the of the of the picture. Why we're so expensive is that we pay more for every item and service of healthcare we use. So this is a, uh, um, a, a, a look at spending again, this is the US as compared to other countries and spending on some outpatient services and some inpatient services. And if you look here, the dotted line that goes down here is the, US, the US price. And then all the other little dots are other countries. So apart from this one here on uh, cataract surgery, where New Zealand is more expensive than us, every other country is less expensive than we are on, on, um, on all of these different ser uh, services. And if you look down here towards the bottom, if you look at things like C-section and angioplasty, bypass surgery, inpatient appendectomy, most countries are 50% um, or, or less, you know, as compared to what the US spends on, the, on, on these services. Now, the more, the more complex question, the harder one to answer, is why are our outcomes so much worse? And that's a multifaceted problem, but let me put out just a couple of pieces that I think uh, contribute to, to our low outcomes. One is the fact that we still have 10% of our, over 10% of our population under age 65 who are uninsured. And uh, none of our uh, OECD peer countries have this. They have very close to universal coverage, if not universal coverage for healthcare. And so this is 10 years after the ACA. We're still, we're still trying to address this gap in coverage. This, who does this affect? So who is uninsured? You can see here the three different uh, snapshots of who's uninsured. The, the circle on the left tells you that most people who are uninsured now after the ACA is fully implemented are working uninsured. In the middle, it tells you that they're lower income for the most part, although not exclusively. So over, you know, over three quarters of that um, pie circle are people earning between 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level, which is for an individual something around uh, 12,000 to, to uh, 50,000 very roughly. 
Um, but there are people above that level as well who, who don't have usually insurance through their jobs and have a hard time affording coverage. And then if you look on the right hand side, um, you know, it disproportionately, it is people of color uh, on, on this slide, um, you know, uh, the Hispanic population who are uninsured. Another driver is the, um, the fact that it has actually actually nothing, nothing to do with our medical care system, but that we underspend on social care as well. So what this slide shows you is that we spend more than our peers on health care, but a lot less than they do on social care. Here we're in the middle and we're that big bar in the light blue, which is healthcare. The darker blue is social care spending. And um, and so, you know, this is a snapshot from work uh, from, by Bradley and Taylor that examines underinvestment in things like public health and social services, safety nets. And we know that that kind of spending, food security, income security, clean water, safe health, housing, all of these things have a um, have a have a strong impact on people's health at the end of the day. And the pandemic has shown a light on these uh, on where these things are missing in people's lives and also on health disparities in the US, revealing why some people are more likely to get sick and when they get sick to end up hospitalized or die. The question is whether we'll see systems and spending shift to address some of these root causes that make people both healthier and also better able to, um, you know, to withstand things like uh, like a pandemic than others. So I'll show you one last thing and then I'll and then I'll hand it over to Daryl. So this is just a snapshot of the disparate effects of COVID based on um, populations by race. And what you're seeing here is the light blue bar is total percentage of um, of population per 10,000 who were hospitalized due to COVID and the dark blue bar is the death rate. And as you can see in the middle, Black Americans and Hispanic Americans were much more likely to be hospitalized and much more likely to be die to, to die than others. Um, so the, the, the many drivers that um, that create um, kind of the the, the uh, less than desirable outcomes in in the U.S. are are harder to address than the price piece of the equation. So let me stop there, and with that, I will stop sharing my slides and hand it over to Daryl. Allison, uh, thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers of the conference. Uh, as an alumnus of the University of Colorado, it's a special pleasure for me to, to join the panel today. Uh, you know, the, the great thing about that question of, can we make healthcare better and cheaper is that it's not theoretical. Uh, what Allison just so, so clearly laid out is that the answer lies in countries around us who are able to achieve both goals, uh, spending less uh, than the $10,000 plus per year we spend here on every man, woman, and child, child and having much better outcomes. And as I think about what might be a root cause for all of this, uh, I found myself uh, going back to 2016, uh, and in, in 2016, the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, uh, in which every year actually publishes its word of the year, in 2016, the OED picked the words post-truth as the word of the year. And when you look at how they defined post-truth, they said that a post-truth situation is one in which opinions and emotion mean much more than facts. Uh, and if we needed evidence that we've entered a post-truth world, COVID has really given it to us. So, so as a physician, you know, I was trained to follow the evidence, just like Tony Fauci. But we find ourselves in this situation where Dr. Fauci and uh, Dr. Walensky and their colleagues repeatedly argue for the value, the evidence, the facts that wearing masks and being vaccinated will lower the infections and deaths we experience from COVID. And we still have large segments of the US population resisting both those simple fact-based things. 
So in terms of looking at solutions that would improve, improve both the affordability and the outcomes of healthcare, I think the fundamental thing that we need to do is that just as we're looking to science and the evidence to guide us around COVID, around how to prevent and treat breast cancer and other things, uh, we need to look to evidence uh, to inform our healthcare policy. And we can dive into more detail about this, but I would assert that the evidence is really overwhelming that people who are insured will lead healthier lives and longer lives at a lower cost to society than those who are uninsured. Uh, I think the evidence shows us that having health insurance isn't just needed, but access to health professions is needed. So having an insurance card isn't enough. You need to be able to get access to healthcare providers, not just when you're ill, but before you become, so you receive adequate preventive care. And, and as Allison pointed out, the evidence is overwhelming that those who are poor, populations of color uh, disproportionately experience poorer health status and outcomes than others, including uh, tragically with COVID. So doctors and health, other healthcare professionals are taught to practice evidence-based medicine, as we call it. Uh, I would argue that the key solution to our problem around US healthcare is to start practicing evidence-based policy to as much as possible, turn down the emotion, turn down the opinion, um, and follow the evidence. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Trina, who among other things, I think has some great real world examples of, of putting the evidence into action in policy. Trina? Great, thanks, Daryl, and thanks, Allison. Um, so, so yeah, as Daryl said, I have. Um, I thought what I bring to the discussion is sort of some real world examples of places where we have actually seen um, spending be controlled, or reduced, or um, you know, providers kind of thriving on lower reimbursements. Um, without sacrificing quality. So what I'm gonna do first though is, is um, offer a little bit of good news about spending in the US. Um, Cause we hear so much about how spending continues to grow and that is absolutely true. And we're spending 18% of our GDP on healthcare. And as um, David pointed out, that was a, a, it was a fraction of that, you know, going back decades and decades and decades. But I'm gonna share my screen and show just maybe a hint of good news around um, spending. So, all right, so hopefully you can see my screen. So what this is, is a um, measure of medical cost trend in the US since 2007. And you can see on the far left, it was about 12%, which means that year over year, um, that was the percentage increase in the cost to treat patients from one year to the next for employers. And so back in 2007, it was 12%. It will cost 12% more, sort of keeping everything the same to treat patients that over the year before. And you can see that since 2007, um, it has come down and it kind of reached a low in 2017 and it's kind of bounced under 6% since then. Um, and this is a, a, a number that we have at, at my um, group Health Research Institute at PwC that we've um, sort of calculated year after year. And you can see that it has just come down year after year. You can see also that with the pandemic last year, we were unsure what was going to happen. So our, our measures of medical cost trend last year for 2021 kind of ranged from 4% to 10%. But I think um, it's important to note that 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 it has that the increase at least has come down but it still is an increase of course you know so six percent means that it's cost it still costs six percent more and that is far more than inflation medical cost trend is not really medical inflation it's a measure of price and volume when you're looking at um at services medical services but nevertheless we see that it hasn't it's not as bad as it used to be and so 
I think that's some good news and there are a lot of reasons for this, but um, but just to, it, it think some things have gotten um, a little bit better, although we are still spending more. And um, as Allison pointed out, we're not getting the outcomes that we should be for all the money that we spend. So I think that one of the pieces of all of this is that the entire US health system is really built for revenue growth. And, and Allison alluded to this, um, that, that we have every piece of the system is really um, aimed at growing. Um, and for good reason. So I think I came from the the newspaper industry, and I experienced the um, sort of tumultuous um, transition that newspapers went through when it, going to digital, and the enormous loss of revenue associated with that, um, and and then also the sort of um, shrinking of the of newspapers in response. And so, you know, in terms of the US healthcare industry, you know, you don't want necessarily that to happen. Um, so, so it's not sort of a simple, well, they should just have less revenue and, and, and everything would be better. But um, because of the, the way that the system is built, we can find some experiments, some sort of exceptions that show that there are other ways to do it. And so um, my first example is Maryland's 40 year experiment in controlling spending. Maryland um, has a waiver that from CMS that basically allows it to um, fund healthcare within the state in a different way. Um, its latest waiver, the total cost of care model started in 2019 and it, um, basically says that they're going to um, make population-based payments to hospitals for hospital services with incentives to for improvements in care. There are incentives for non-hospital providers to partner with hospitals and improve quality of care. And there are incentives to providers to reduce hospitalizations and do other kinds of improving things. So with all of this, the idea is we're going to basically cap growth on Medicare spending in the state and and any savings will be um, shared with the state. And so this is an area where Maryland has done this for 40 years in various ways. And they've proven that they can do this without sort of sacrificing quality, without widespread closures of hospitals, without any kind of tumultuous changes in the way that people receive care and, and hold the line on growth in spending in the state on healthcare. And so this is an example of something that's been successful, but I think it's also an example of how these kinds of experiments don't necessarily spread. We've had this for 40 years and yet there is not, you know, 49 other states doing this. So Maryland is an example of, of a different way to fund healthcare without sacrificing quality. And here, um, you know, in Colorado, there's Artist Family Medicine, which is a um, primary care practice that specializes in Medicaid, um, people p covered by Medicaid, low reimbursements, kind of a, lots of family medicine, medical practices do not accept Medicaid patients or limit the number of patients that they take um, because of the low reimbursements. And Artist Family Medicine has figured out a way to actually specialize in Medicaid patients and make money doing it. And so they are kind of a great example of how you can in this country make, um, you know, sort of turn, I, I think the, the head of this um, group calls it bleeding heart capitalism, where you can um, specialize in, in providing good quality care, understand your patients, um, and do it on lower reimbursements and still make money. And so again, we have a good example, I think, of a solution where you have um, a different model that works, that still makes money, that kind of works in our system as it is right now. So with that, I'm not gonna go on and on. Um, I will turn it over to David, who will kind of start the, the panel discussion. Terrific. Welcome back. Um, uh, if each of the panelists would unmute yourself so we can have a conversation, um, I encourage uh, people watching on YouTube to submit questions on the YouTube chat, uh, and I will be able to read them from, from my screen. Um, but let me start with a question. 
Um, and that is, do we have a health care system or do we have an illness care system? Do we really have two distinct problems? Health care access, quality and cost. Clearly, we have that problem and a distinct health care financing methodology problem. Uh, Maryland has had this this uh, alternative uh, funding uh, methodology for 40 years. Um, other uh, small communities, the artist group that that uh, Trina uh, mentioned, uh, have found niches. Um, there are safety net hospitals, fewer of them than there were back before Medicare and Medicaid. Um, what what do you think, Trina? Do you want to start? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think I mean I think it's clear that we have a um, an Ill, a, a system that is really built to treat people once they become sick, and it's not that much focused on um, preventing those illnesses. Although there are many, many, many projects all over the country trying to address and prevent address sort of preventative uh, services and try to prevent um, ER visits and hospitalizations and, and things like that. But overall, the system really is geared toward treating people once they get sick. And that's part of the reason we spend, I think Allison's slide showing the social spending versus the healthcare spending is really clear that we spend a lot of money um, downstream once people get ill and we're not as good at, at preventing it. I think if you just look at diabetes alone, um, and how much money is spent on on the suffering that comes from amputations and things like that that are that are preventable and you could prevent someone from getting to that point but it's very it's complicated to to address all of the different factors that eventually lead if ignored to amputations and, and other kinds of suffering that, that folks go through so I think we have, that is one of the fundamental issues of our system that that spending really happens at after a lot of suffering has happened. And I think that's a piece too that's in this is that a lot of that suffering and that spending is probably preventable, but our system isn't really set up very well to do that. Others? Let me try another question. And okay. I would not have asked this question um, two years ago. What has happened to public health over the last 50 to 100 years? Um, I, I heard uh, a commentator say the other day when asked whether we were prepared for another pandemic, he said, we will be for the next 10 years. After that, I'm not so sure. It really goes to this issue of our short memory, the fact that we um, don't seem to learn from the past and invest sufficiently in the social networks and in the preventive networks because they may not have immediate um, uh, benefit, uh, but we know the cost of not doing that. Daryl? Yeah, if I could weigh in, David, and, and uh, our technical support is trying to work with me about the echo uh, some have said we're getting, and I apologize for that. Uh, the, um, I think the fundamental problem in our system is that the system over rewards certain things and under rewards other things. So I was a health system CEO and I had to keep our health system in a financially stable state. Well, that meant waking up every morning, hoping the beds were full, that the operating rooms were fully occupied. Uh, there was no great financial incentive to keep people out of the hospital, uh, to keep the ORs empty. Uh, right down to the schedule that determines what physicians get paid. Uh, I had a friend who's a family physician who lamented the fact that he would be paid more to remove a plug of earwax <laughs> than to have an end of life discussion with a, a dying patient. Uh, so uh, when you get right down to the basic incentives of the system, as, as Trina emphasized, it's a volume-based system. It's not a value-based system. And uh, so those payment schedules for physician fees, those reimbursement schedules for hospitals will have to shift 
um, we're spending four four trillion dollars a year nearly in this country. I, I would argue that's enough money if we can have the will to reallocate it in the right directions, we will get better outcomes without pushing spending even higher. Others? You know, I'd love to jump in on this one because if you think about where the responsibility has been for public health, these kind of broader um, investments, it has been devolved to the state level. We've left that to states to deal with. And so you see, you see a couple of different things just in terms of structural incentives to invest in it. The first is that you see that states have to balance their budgets at the end of the year. And so it's harder for them to make these kinds of big, broad public health investments. And second of all, think about the populations who suffer from our lack of investments in public health. It is people who are, tend to be lower income and people of color who don't have access to food security, to clean water, um, you know, who, who, who live in buildings that are not safe. And so they are the least enfranchised and, um, and, you know, and their voices are not heard in this system. And so it's both kind of structurally who we've asked to solve this and then who, who, they're, who they're listening to as well that has caused these kinds of systemic underinvestments in this country. Yeah, it's not like a pandemic is a new thing. You know, if you look back um, at past pandemics, you even look back at, say, like the cholera um, epidemics of the 19th century, and you look at who suffered then, um, it was minorities and it was the, the lower income folks. And all, all, so many parallels happened then to what we experience today. And then you had three sort of rounds of cholera pandemics in the 19th century. You had the 1918, 1919s you know, influenza pandemic, you had, uh, you know, in, ensuing pandemics, you had SARS kind of appear in Canada. And you, so you had a dress rehearsal and a reminder that we should be doing something. And yet the spending, like Allison said, and like Daryl said, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's very hard to argue to spend money on something to prevent something because the success is hard to measure. Well, it didn't happen. Or, you know, we, we didn't have a cataclysm of 550,000 people dying in a year, you know, that, you don't necessarily celebrate what you don't know that you prevented. And so I think we have this, we have this constant, we know what's gonna happen. It's not a mystery. And yet it's very hard still to prepare adequately. Um, so that's my, my addition to, to, to this problem. I'm skeptical that we will be prepared for the next one. Hopefully it will be a hundred years from now. So we have another question. Um, and it goes to uh, our costs versus those in other countries. What responsibilities do U.S. citizens have for maintaining their own health? Um, smoking, drinking, obesity, exercise, uh, risky behaviors, uh, a decision not to have health insurance, and therefore avoid the out-of-pocket costs that may come until you're really, really sick and you throw yourself on the health care system. Um, we have a requirement that uh, children in the U.S. go to school through the 12th grade, um, well, or at least till they're 16 and they, they can elect out. Um, uh, and communities are expected to stand up a public health, I mean, a public school system. We don't have that in, in health care, and yet there seems to be a lot of similarity. Anyone want to pick up on that? Maybe I'll say a quick word to start us off on this one, which is that it's a particularly American idea that it should be an individual's responsibility to, to solve these problems. And um, it's problematic, in my opinion, for a couple of reasons. The, the first of all is that is that much of the pieces that drive whether somebody's healthy or not don't lie in individuals' hands. So if you think about, um, you know, if, if you think about um, you know, people who grow up with fewer resources or in communities where there are not fresh foods nearby or who don't have the uh, luxury of, of extra disposable income at the end of each month to go to a gym and to, and to, to do some of these, you know, health enhancing behaviors. I mean, that, that's not shared. People, some people have access and other people don't to um, the luxury of being able to invest in that kind of way. I know that's hard for people in Colorado to imagine, especially in, in, in Boulder, where health is kind of, you know, front and center for, for many people, but, um, but some people don't have the luxury of that. 
And then, uh, and then the other piece is that um, if you think about a lot of the kind of structural solutions that will make people healthier, it takes collective investment. It takes collective investment in systems rather than kind of individual action. And that's what other countries have um, embraced in a way that we've resisted. When I teach health law and I talk to my students about the health insurance system, I have foreign students who will take my class, um, LLM students. And they'll ask things like, this system lacks solidarity. Where is the solidarity in this system? And my, um, my, my students who grew up in the US will ask, what is solidarity? And so it's, it's kind of like, a um, you know, what is, the, what is the system based on? And then how does that affect kind of where, you know, what, where uh, collectively we build structures that can help people be healthier? You know, Allison, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I, I think the rugged individualism that Americans pride themselves on is a problem when it pays, plays out these ways in healthcare. Um, but what encourages me is if you look at social movements in this country, we have gotten it right, like wearing seatbelts, you know, through, through a combination of social pressure and good policy, people wear seatbelts and we dramatically changed that situation. Uh, smoking cessation is another example of governmental policy combined uh, with a, a social movement. Um, so that gives me some encouragement. Uh, but the politicization of healthcare has been so extreme, it's made it unusually resistant to a social movement uh, of a similar move toward taking more responsibility for health behavior. And, you know, Daryl, I would look at both of those examples you just put out there, and I would say those are examples where we have not looked to individual responsibility, where we've had the government step in, and we've had others step in, you know, to invest in, in kind of a collective way, and that's what's moved the needle on, on those issues where it was hard to do so, you know, beforehand. Yeah, but at the I'd end argue. of the day, we, we all fasten our seatbelt, not because a policeman is watching us, but because we've been... <laughs> We've internalized our responsibility. But we have those seatbelts in our cars because the federal <laughs> government has put them in there, right? Touche, touche. Yeah. I'd argue that we're, we're heading toward more individual responsibility for things, not less, in that you have the growth of high deductible health plans, which are intended in part to encourage people to shop for care, but also to make decisions about their health that prevent, this is the thinking, you know, these, these um, expensive uh, problems down the line. And we even have the sort of new federal rules on price transparency for both provider negotiated rates and payer negotiated rates coming down the line. The provider ones are here, the payer ones are coming. And the idea is, well, consumers should be also comparing prices and sort of thinking about where they go get care. And, and, and so it, it's the consumerization of the healthcare system that I think this, this illness-based um, responsibility is wrapped into that. And so I think we're moving even further down that and even you know we have the seatbelts, but I wonder if seatbelts were kind of proposed today whether we would have it. I don't know. I think some states would, and I think some states would not. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I think we're kind of heading in in the in the toward more consumer responsibility for everything about their health, including spending and sort of behaviors and lifestyle factors. But that that's just what I'm. My, my, I, I, I've heard a couple of things here, Indivi rugged individuals, um, I guess those aren't the obese, drinking, exercise-free smokers, but um, <laughs> this idea of individual choice. And there are some things uh, that we uh, get behind the idea of choice and, and some things that we don't for the, for in the public interest and in the public good. We have a number of questions about cost. So let me, let me try to assemble these. One is why, is, why are prices so high? Who is uh, responsible for the obscenely unaffordable 5,000, 10,000, 7,000 deductible plans, which of course is, was a, a shift from what originally started out as what we called first dollar coverage in order to put some responsibility 
on the individual. We have that in the car insurance business where you have deductibles um, that you pay before the insurance company takes over. And, um, and then a question, do we need to switch from paying for health insurance to instead paying for health care? Um, also removing it from being connected to your job. Um, so the idea of taking it out of your job, and you recall at the beginning, I talked about how it ended up being part of a, of a compensation plan um, when, uh, when uh, wages were frozen. So wh what are some of the things we can do about costs? Let me add one more in here, which sort of plays into it. Um, how much have medical costs increased with, the, increased with the change in the law that permits medications drugs, pharmaceuticals, to be advertised on TV and in and magazines. I don't know what we did uh, before we learned about all of the problems that people have on TV. Who wants to take some of that cost question? Maybe I'll pick off a little piece of it. It's a big question, but... Um, yeah. Maybe I'll pick off a little piece of it that is coming from where Trina left off on her last answer, which is that as the cost of the system have escalated, what have we done to try to manage it? We've shifted more of those costs onto individuals and said to people, it's now your responsibility to figure out where to get cheaper care and where to spend less. And what's amazing is we, we're now decades into this experiment. Um, the, the question about you know who's responsible for these high deductible health plans, I blame people like Regina Herzlinger and, and Mark Polly, who are the thought leaders that told us that if you put more quote unquote skin in the game, that people will be better consumers of healthcare. And we've just seen for those of you who have tried to figure out where to go for care and, uh, and you know where you'll get good care for less cost, know how hard that is to do uh, in your spare time, right? Between all the other things that you have to balance. And the evidence just overwhelmingly shows that these um, these plans and these kinds of incentives don't play out the way that the uh, the masterminds of them expected them to, and then the 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 um, the question about why are prices so high? Prices are so high because, as compared to other countries, because in other countries the the regulators set the prices. The federal government either has a total budget, like in Maryland, what Trina was talking about, that says this is how much we're going to spend on healthcare in the in the year, or they are the payer. And so they determine kind of what the prices will be for healthcare. And we, we have that in this country in the, in the Medicare program and Medicare cost growth is much less than private insurance and, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and networks are broad, right? So we have a version of that, but we have a system that's much more complicated than that. But these, I mean, these are all, there, there are so many different pieces as the questions allude to that um, are both, you know, driving the problem, but then also not solving it. You know, I guess I would take a bit of issue, though. I think in terms of trying to contain health care costs, we have our best hope is the fact that the, the governmentally funded health insurance plans have steadily grown, not just Medicare and Medicaid, but the, uh, uh, the VA, the Department of Defense. We have more and more Americans who essentially... Uh, are under a government health insurance plan. And in turn, those plans will really um, shape how the private health insurance market charges. So if we started using the leverage of government health insurance better, uh, if we didn't just have Medicare be another fee-for-service system, would have a shift more toward being value-based payments, we could really start to take advantage of the leverage of the huge amount of healthcare that is paid for now by the government. Well, let's talk about leverage for a moment because um, the pharmaceutical lobby has leverage and we do, we do not as a nation um, insist on a, on, a, on a negotiated price for pharmaceuticals. Uh, the way other countries do. And America is arguably paying for much of the fundamental research that brings us the new drugs that, that uh, become available to people around the world. Um, but is that really our responsibility? And do we have a problem with uh, legislators and people in the executive branch being influenced so heavily by uh, the lobbyists 
um, the lobbyists for the pharmaceutical companies, for the hospitals, uh, for the various physician specialties. And is that really driving a lot of the cost? I, I would say, David, that I don't think if you look at the sort of pharma, pharmaceutical spend, it's not, it's not the biggest chunk in our healthcare spending. It's 17, 18, 19%, maybe something around there. And a good chunk of our spending is generic. Most people you know, are, are taking generics. The prices are very, very low for the most part. The, the questions are all around sort of spe- the growth of specialty drugs and biologics and um, the, the, the huge pipeline of gene and cell therapies that are coming down the line, which have huge price tags that might save you know, lifetime spending, but they're covered by a payer that might only have that person for Couple di- you know, a couple of years. And so they're paying a huge amount up front and never will reap the, the, the savings on not treating that person for many other things down the road. So there's a big question about how to, pr- how to price and, and pay for those. But I think if we take apart that whole, that, those different pieces, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller slice that, um, that is sort of has the, the big growth in spending. And then there are some, you know, kind of outlying examples of you know, these old drugs that are being sold for a thousand times more, you know, now than they were before. But I think um, that the drug, com- the sort of drug industry has gotten a lot of the attention, but that, um, that it's, that it's a more nuanced situation and that the, the providers and the hospitals, um, they, they also contribute to this sort of rise in prices, but the prices are so um, opaque uh, until now. Now they're, they're sort of coming forward because of these rules, but, but they have been so opaque and the drug prices are, are much more transparent. They're, they're available to you right when you pay for them at the drug counter. So I, I, think, I think that it's, um, we'll see. I think there's, there's a lot of momentum in Congress right now to do, do something about drug prices. And I think we might even see some kind of re- rethinking of the Medicare Part D benefit and the way it's structured. Um, and we'll see if that, that sort of um, changes what people are paying out of pocket. But anyway, those are my thoughts on drug pricing. I, yeah. Trina, I think that there, there's an underlying issue there um, that for me as a, as a physician is really important and it's the ethical one. So you see drugs that are essentially biologics now being advertised on television, David, to your point, uh, that are extremely expensive. And the evidence shows may add a small amount of time to life expectancy. Uh, but all the pressure is to use the drug. And if you're one of those patients, the pressure becomes to use that drug. But in reality, the ethical decision at the end of life should be one of suffering, of pain, quality of life, as much as four to eight more weeks of life. And uh, as as I've been thinking about this, I, I think that one of the really worrisome aspects Uh, for health professionals has become, we're working in a fundamentally unethical healthcare system. You know, we're taught in medical school to do good for patients, to avoid harm, to respect their autonomy, and to to be just in delivering healthcare. And there are all these injustices, there are all these things we're doing that actually don't accrue to the benefit of patients. And uh, so one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking about and working on is how do we really help the healthcare workforce recapture its ethical foundations? Hmm. I I think that in turn can help shift healthcare policy going forward. I wrote an article about this and what dismayed me the most was I got a lot of negative feedback from physicians who said, I only want to care about the patient in front of me. Don't make me think about society. But I, I think we have to start as healthcare providers thinking about the social impact. In, in the United States, we embed, and, and the audience may or may not know this, we embed in the healthcare dollar, the cost of educating and training 
physicians. And um, the average medical student graduates from medical school with $200,000 in debt and is looking, that's from medical school, and then is looking at three, four, five or more years of, uh, of uh, residency training before they become a practicing physician independent of their uh, training experience. And, and they have to amortize that debt. They have to recover that debt. Um, and some do it by service, by joining the public health service or serving underserved areas. Um, and the, the residency training is paid for through the Medicare, mostly through the Medicare system, and, um, and is embedded in the prices that Medicare pays for health care in hospitals. And so um, in other countries, medical education, if you're, if you're bright enough and motivated enough to go to medical school, uh, is, is not charged to the individual or at a very nominal rate. And graduate training is paid for through the general tax dollar, as is medical education. So um, there's this cost, which is in the hundreds of billions of dollars a year, I would guess, Daryl, um, is, is really reflected in our health care costs when it's really about educating the next generation of providers. And it also influences where physicians choose to practice um, because they need to recover this, this debt or absolve it. Any comments from Daryl and from others? You're muted. This issue gets embedded in our larger struggle in America about free enterprise and capitalism versus the social good. Uh, uh, I think most people pursuing health professions careers are basically altruistic and truly want to deliver good care and take care of people. They're not getting into health professions for the income. But I think the system does distort that badly. Debt does, debt and future income potential does become a factor in the decisions students make. Uh, that said, uh, uh, we're having a harder and harder time in America <laughs> treating some things like social goods. My personal opinion is I would be happy to have medical school funded by an all payer trust fund. Uh, I just don't see the political will to do that. And I think, I think Daryl, just to add to that, um, that you see the, the need, there's a huge need for something like, let's say mental health professionals, massive demand. And yet partly because it's not, it's, it's sort of in that lower end of income. And if you're coming out of medical school with $200,000 in debt, you, you look at that and say, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specialize and, and make a lot more so I can pay that off and have the, the life that I want to have. And so in a way, like one of the, 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 the mismatches in our system is that the demand is not always um, matched with, the, with, the, with, with what we produce in terms of medical professionals, doctors, nurses, therapists, the whole, the whole gamut. And yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's, we'll see this with the mental health surge from the pandemic, the huge demand. I mean, just un unbelievable. And, and there are no people out there able to, to absorb it. And, you know, how long will it take for us to produce the professionals that can do that? I, I mean, there's no, there's no mechanism to make that happen really, honestly. So I agree with you, Daryl. I think it's, it's a, but there's not really a, any, I've not seen any proposal that to change the system really put forward. Well, the, there's an old saying, folly is hoping for A while rewarding B. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, speaking as a psychiatrist, we hope for better mental health care in the United States, but we tend to reward surgical procedures yeah. um, much more richly. Yeah. One of the principles of, of the CWA that I've learned is never to end on a downer. So I, I need, I, uh, I, what I, we're going to do is we're going to allow each of you to make a closing statement of about a minute. So, um, Allison, would you feel comfortable going first? Sure. 
So I would love to to address um, one of the places. Actually, there was a question about this, and it's a place where I see some optimism. Is that I think we've started to question fundamentally whether the current structures work, and uh, you know, both in thinking about how do we pay for care and should that be tied to a job, and or you know, is there a better way in the future to think about um, financing healthcare, and then also, especially at the end of this this year, this past year understanding that public health is something that's actually really important. And uh, I see conversations in the academy around it and around racial disparities in healthcare and income disparities in healthcare in a way that I've never seen before in, ter in terms of the intensity of them in my career. So I think we're asking the right questions and I'm hopeful that that will move us in a better direction going forward. Trina? Let's see. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to end on a positive note too, <laughs> after bringing up the down the downbeat. Um, I think I think that you know, part of this whole, if, especially if you look at the pandemic and the experience of the pandemic, you have this these two kind of things that were that happened. You had the the um, the the huge sort of human cataclysm the huge number of deaths in the United States, the disproportionate share of them that were born by African-Americans and Latinx Americans. And again, and beyond even deaths, hospitalizations and cases, so a lot of suffering. And, and so we have this, this issue. And I feel like, like Allison said, I, I feel like this has come to the forefront and, and that there is a sense in industry on all levels from pharmaceutical company executives to insurance company executives to provider hospital system executives, there is this awareness and this sort of sense that there's something has to be done around this. And so you even see a lot of discussions in the pharma world of, we need to bring better diversity to clinical trials that the days of it only being white men are over and that we really need to expand that and that it's no longer okay to have that be the way that we do things. And so I think that is one big positive that I've seen kind of come out of this and that, that, view should also increase outcomes, make people healthier, and also decrease spending. And the other piece of it is the, in, the marvel of the vaccines. And so I think also the science piece of it, that we have figured out how to turn around a vaccine, multiple vaccines that are safe and effective in less than a year and get them into arms, is, is something of a, of a scientific marvel and a logistical and manufacturing marvel too. And so that too, I think the more of those kinds of pieces that also improves people's lives and decreases spending. And so on suffering and all the treatments down the road. And so I think these two pieces, if we look at the pandemic, I think it's raised awareness and sort of given people a sense that we cannot continue to do things the way we did them before. Plus it's highlighted the sort of scientific marvel and the ability of us to do these things in record time um, that, that, that will also kind of improve lives and decrease spending, so. Thank you. Daryl? On, uh, on Monday evening, uh, in conjunction with the Conference on World Affairs, I was able to speak to uh, about 45 pre-medical students from the University of Colorado. And that, anytime I speak with people going into the health professions, it makes me feel optimistic. Uh, the generation that's entering the health professions now really wants to fix this. They feel that we're at a tipping point. They see the injustices in the healthcare system, and they're much less likely, in my view, to tolerate them than we have been. Uh, so that gives me real, real hope for the future. Winston Churchill is sitting up there somewhere saying Americans will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. I, I hope we are done trying and start doing. In closing, let me make a few brief comments. Thank you again, audience, for joining us today, and a special thank you to our speakers who have volunteered their time to be with us today. If you would like to support them and learn more about their work, you can find their books, podcasts, and social media accounts linked on the CWA site website. The CWA relies on the generosity of people like you to make this event possible. Please consider making a gift to the CWA, which can also be done on the CWA website. Tune in through tomorrow, Sunday, April 11th, for live CWA events or to catch up 
on those that you missed on the CWA YouTube channel. Recall, recall that all of these uh, programs have been recorded and are available to you. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.